Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 16, July 5th through July 11th, 1861. Last week, we talked about the Battle of Hoax Run and sort of kicked off the Manassas Campaign of 1861. We had a discussion about immigrant contributions to the Civil War that for sure will be ongoing as we move forward. There was also a short overview of slavery as well. This week, we will check back into the fronts we have already been discussing in previous episodes, so what is going on in Missouri uh, as well as West Virginia. To close things out, I want to continue our slavery discussion with introducing Harriet Jacobs. But let's first head to continue our saga leading up to the Battle of Wilson's Creek. When last we left Missouri, Nathaniel Lyon had swiftly moved against the Missouri State Guard and defeated them at Boonville. This, of course, was after the famous meeting at the Planters House Hotel in St. Louis. Confederate forces had withdrawn to the southwest corner of the state and were attempting to form into a more orderly unit. Sniffing that although there were superior numbers on the Confederate side, so far they had not put up much of a fight. Union forces prepared an expedition to seek out Claiborne Fox Jackson and the remainder of his men. Leading this contingent would be Franz Siegel. Franz Siegel had already been mentioned a time or two in our narrative here. He participated in the Camp Jackson Affair and has been part of the German Volunteer Forces. Born in Baden, Germany in 1824, Siegel would attend a military academy. During the revolutions of 1848, Siegel served as a minister of war for the revolutionaries. He would flee Germany first to England and eventually arriving in New York in 1852. Before the war, he was a school teacher and moved to St. Louis, eventually becoming the director of schools. All the while, he had served as a militia commander as well. Siegel would be important for the recruitment of Germans to the Union cause. I fight Smith Siegel became a common phrase amongst these German soldiers. Siegel would lead a little over 1,000 men with orders to disperse the enemy camped at Lamar, Missouri, which is not only 18 miles north of Carthage, Missouri, where Siegel had camped, but also is the birthplace of Harry Truman. Fun fact. Facing off against Siegel and his outnumbered men were those under the command of Generals William Slack, John Bullock, Clark Sr., Mosby Parsons, and Colonel Richard Waitman. Slack was born in 1816 and moved to Missouri to practice law. He had served under Sterling Price during the Mexican-American War. John Bullock Clark Sr. was a former congressman from Missouri, and his son John Bullock Clark Jr. had attended Harvard and would also serve as a general in the Confederate Army. He is present at Carthage as a major. Parsons was originally from Virginia, and had served as attorney general and a senator after moving to Missouri. He had been a close ally of Governor Jackson. After the war, he flees to Mexico and is suspected uh, to be killed by Republican irregular forces down there. Waitman was actually born in Washington, D.C., and attended the University of Virginia before moving to St. Louis. He was actually expelled from West Point for cutting another cadet in the face with a knife, but still serves in the Mexican-American War before settling in New Mexico, where, working as a newspaper man, uh, he's also an Indian agent. He is elected to Congress, representing that state as well. In 1854, Waitman will get into an altercation with French-Canadian explorer Francois Xavier Aubrey. Aubrey's claim to fame is that he set the record for travel along the Santa Fe Trail 
and explored the area west of the Continental Divide. In the altercation, Aubrey would draw a pistol, but it misfired, and Waitman stabbed him fatally with a knife. Afterwards, he would move back to Missouri. On July 5th, 1861, Governor Jackson would appear north of the city to the surprise of the Union forces. Siegel had a choice. He could withdraw, or he could stay and fight. He was heavily outnumbered, some 4,000 compared to his 1,000 men, but his Missouri volunteers had not yet tasted defeat. His Union regiments were also well-armed, as opposed to the Confederates, who were armed with a hodgepodge of weapons, including hunting rifles and shotguns. So despite the forces laid against him, Siegel would deploy his own men. The battle will open with an artillery duel between the few pieces on either side before a general Confederate assault was ordered. With the amount of men, they were able to threaten the flanks of the smaller force, so Siegel would begin to withdraw his men. Confederates would chase them 10 miles to the south toward the town of Carthage. It would be a running fight with clashes against the rear guard of the Union force. Confederate cavalry would move in behind the retreating Federals as well. They offer little resistance against the Union infantry, who will continue on. With the Confederates disorganized, Siegel is able to form his men on strong positions around the town. Skirmishing would continue, during which time the Union forces would become aware of a large body of Missouri State Guard moving toward their flank. These men were actually unarmed recruits, but the fear that they would possibly actually be reinforcements uh, would, of course, cause a further withdrawal from Siegel. The all-day fight would conclude with the Union forces being able to slip away in the darkness, away from the disorganized rebels. The battle saw 200 Confederate casualties as opposed to only 40 Union. Although they suffered more in terms of losses, the Confederates would claim victory, having forced Siegel away from the field. Any good news for the Southern cause in Missouri was welcome, especially as they had been going poorly up to that point. Also of note, during the battle in the Confederate cavalry contingent is a group of partisan rangers under the command of Joseph Orville Shelby. Shelby had been born in Kentucky and become a large plantation and slave owner in that state. He had moved into Missouri during Bleeding Kansas and participated in border ruffian raids, including the Sack of Lawrence we talked about not too long ago. He will be with us commanding cavalry in the Trans-Mississippi for the rest of the war, rising to the rank of general. His cavalry would become known as the Iron Brigade, which is not THE Iron Brigade, uh, one of my other favorite Union units. In 1863, he will conduct a great raid into Missouri. After the war, he flees to Mexico, rather than surrender, but will return and become a U.S. Marshal. Let's shift our focus and check back in on what George B. McClellan is doing in West Virginia. When we last dropped in, McClellan had become famous with his one-sided victory at Philippi, uh, where they completely routed the Confederate forces, despite George B. McClellan not actually having been present. McClellan's Department of Ohio is now facing two mountain passes controlled by Confederates, one at a place called Rich Mountain, and the other at Laurel Hill. Commanding the rebels is General Robert Garnett, stationed at Laurel Hill, and Lieutenant Colonel John Pegram at Rich Mountain. Garnett is a native of Virginia and veteran of the Mexican-American War, where he was breveted twice for gallantry. Prior to the Civil War, he had been stationed in Washington and participated in conflicts against the Yakima and other native tribes in that region. He is also partially responsible for the design of Fort Simcoe. John Pegram was also a Virginian, being born in Petersburg in 1832. After attending West Point, Pegram would be sent to observe the Austrian army before being assigned to the New Mexico Territory. He would continue on as a general in the Confederate Army, where he would die in the later stages of the war. In 
McClellan's force would be facing the two blocked passes through the mountains. Rich Mountain actually overlooked the Stanton Parkersburg Turnpike. The Confederates had fortified the pass, naming their position Camp Garnett. Pegram had 1,300 men and several cannon. McClellan would send General Thomas A. Morris to Laura Hill, where Garnett was stationed, while the remainder of his men would face off against Camp Garnett. McClellan would send a reinforced brigade to move in around to the rear of the Confederates. A frontal assault, he surmised, would be costly, but if he were to be able to flank the rebels, this would collapse both the Camp Garnett and Laurel Hill positions. Pegram had placed men at the Joseph Hart homestead as protection. Joseph Hart's 22-year-old son would lead the brigade by mountain pass to appear around the Confederate position. Commanding the brigade was one William S. Rosecrans. Rosecrans, or Old Rosie, as his men knew him, was born in Delaware County, Ohio in 1819. His father had served with William Henry Harrison, callback to episode one. William did not have a formal education, but that did not stop him from excelling at West Point, where he finished fifth out of 56. Serving as an engineer, he would be assigned to Fort Monroe and improve coastal defenses in Virginia. It was during this assignment that William would convert to Catholicism. Now, during these introductions, this is the part where you might say, let me guess, he served in the Mexican-American War like all the others. But you would be wrong, because Rosecrans does not go to Mexico. Instead, he was teaching at West Point. Trying to continue down the teaching path, he applied to teach at Virginia Military Institute, but was passed over for none other than Thomas Jackson. Rosecrans would resign his commission after this setback and have an interesting antebellum career until Fort Sumter. He ran an oil refinery in Cincinnati, Ohio, and also acquired several patents. His inventions included the first kerosene lamp to successfully burn a round wick and more effective way of manufacturing soap. In 1859, he was actually severely burned by an oil lamp which left him with facial scarring, seeming like he had a perpetual smirk. Rosecrans was fairly outspoken and would openly argue with superiors, which, as you could imagine, did not make him many friends. After the war, he will go on to serve as a congressman from California. On July 11, 1861, the 2,000 men under Rosecrans, led by their local guide, would make their way over the mountain, but were delayed by dense woodland and rain. By the afternoon, the Union forces encountered the rebel pickets placed at the summit of Rich Mountain and engaged them. To their credit, the Confederates were able to hold off the assault by a superior force for two hours before being forced to withdraw. Pegram's force was effectively cut in half, with many of his men escaping to the nearby town of Beverly. Some were not so lucky, and on the 13th, Pegram, among other Confederates, were forced to surrender. The victory came at the cost of 46 Union casualties, as opposed to 300 Confederate. This was an important engagement, as Laurel Hill had to be abandoned by General Garnett. Furthermore, it added to McClellan's reputation, as he was able to successfully announce yet another route of Confederate forces. West Virginia was continuing to fall further from the grasp of the rebels. To close out today, I'd like to mention Harriet Jacobs to piggyback off of our slavery discussion from last week. Most folks, I think, may not have heard of Harriet Jacobs. If there is a Harriet connected with abolition, I'd guess it would be Harriet Tubman, who I would want to cover in a future segment along with the Underground Railroad. Jacobs would write a book titled Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, where we get a good idea of what slavery was like. She was born in North Carolina in 1813. 
Unfortunately, she was sexually assaulted by her master, Dr. James Norcom. Jacobs had become involved with a local lawyer as well, who she also had children with. Norcom would threaten to sell Harriet's children if she did not give in, so she hid in a crawl space for seven years, only coming out at night to exercise. I have a quote from her book regarding the entire situation. My master began to whisper foul words in my ear. Young as I was, I could not remain ignorant of their import. The master's age, my extreme youth, and the fear that his conduct would be reported to my grandmother made him bear this treatment for many months. He peopled my young mind with unclean images such that only a vile monster could think of. I turned from him with disgust and hatred, but he was my master. I was compelled to live under the same roof with him where I saw a man, 40 years my senior, daily violating the most sacred commandments of nature. He told me I was his property, that I must subject to his will in all things. My soul revolted against the mean tyranny, but where could I turn for protection? She goes on to say, Surely, if you credited one half of the truths that were told to you concerning the helpless millions suffering cruel bondage, you at the North would not help to tighten the yoke. I think it is important to remember that this is a common tale, perhaps for many others who did not write their memoirs, and a vivid description of just how terrible things could be. Eventually, Harriet was able to escape via boat to the North, she would be reunited with her children and brother in 1843. In 1852, her freedom was illegally bought. Jacobs would work with our old friends William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass, giving lectures. She would help escape slaves during the war and establish schools in newly liberated areas. Hers is an interesting story, and I know that perhaps these few sentences and a quote would hardly do it justice, but I still think it is worth mentioning and uh, certainly was something that I was not aware of before doing a little bit of research, so I uh, think it's pretty interesting. That'll do it for this week. I know there was a shorter episode, but we talked about what was happening in Missouri with the Battle of Carthage and in West Virginia in the Battle of Rich Mountain. We also introduced the interesting figure of Harriet Jacobs. Next week, we will be barreling even closer to First Bull Run, and we will continue with West Virginia to wrap up some of these initial battles. I think I will also plug in Nat Turnell's Rebellion, which I mentioned I would do last week, but I figured it's a good time to put it while we have discussed slavery and Harriet Jacobs. In addition, I'll also be mentioning a couple other slave rebellions uh, that were leading up to the Civil War. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Rosecrans and his men won't find their way through the passes around Rich Mountain unless they receive some reviews. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, the Patreon, and Venmo. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Questions, comments, concerns, all are welcome. Thank you so much for listening and have a great week.